I'd like to talk to you today about three keys to finding your purpose. But before I do that, I just want to spend some time here talking about uh, your mindset as it relates to work. For how many of you, when you show up to work every day, you're showing up just to a job? For some of you, maybe it's a career, but for how many of you are you showing up to work every day and you really truly believe that you're showing up to your calling? You're showing up to your purpose. You're showing up to what it was that you were created to do. Now let's talk a little bit about the difference between these three. You see, people who show up to a job every day, it, it, it's kind of like folks that are waiting to get paroled. You know what I mean? I mean, they've got a countdown timer on their phone and the highlight of their life is when they can retire. What a terrible place to be in, my friends. A career is a little bit different than a job. A career implies that there's opportunity for growth, there's opportunity for development, but still, without purpose, a career can be meaningless. A calling, however, my friend, it's what's in our DNA. It's what we were created to do. It's our purpose in life. It feels connected to your purpose and your values. And yes, a calling can pay the bills, but it connects you to the difference that you want to make in the world. Now you see, many of us will spend 150,000 hours of our life at work. It's a long time. If you want to break it down further, that's about 40% of your life that you will spend working. That's 18,000 750 days or about 17 years of your life without hitting pause that you're going to be spending working. And how miserable is it to be in a job that you do not work for that length of time? You see, two out of three people say that they don't just dislike their job, they hate their jobs. And I don't understand that. I don't understand how people get up every day and they go to a job that they do not like and they call it life. I don't understand that. It makes no sense to me, friends. Now, if you don't know whether or not you need to find a new career, perhaps this it can will help be you. hard to know when you need a new job. As a rule, if you hate going to work every day, it may be time. <laughs> If you hate going to work and your co-workers don't respect you, hey, dummy. it may be time. If you hate going to work, your co-workers don't respect you, dummy. and you always wish you were somewhere else, it may be time. If you hate going to work, your co-workers don't respect you, dummy. you wish you were somewhere else, and you cry constantly, it may be time. If you hate going to work, no one respects you, you wish you were somewhere else, you cry constantly, and you daydream of punching small animals. Good deal. If you hate going to work, no one respects you, you wish you were somewhere else, you cry constantly, you daydream of punching small animals, and you sit next to this guy, it may be time. If you make loads of money, it may not be dark, though. But if you make loads of money, you hate going to work, no one respects you, you wish you were somewhere else, you cry constantly, you daydream of punching small animals, and you sit next to this guy, it's probably time, as a rule. Friends, you know, 70% of people at work are not motivated to do their jobs. And those of you who are in a leadership position, you probably agree with this thing. Now, that is a personal issue. You know, we have to find our own motivation, but it's also a leadership issue, too. And a lot of that goes back to connecting people with the why. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the purpose, connecting people with the purpose behind why it is that we do what it is that we do. Now, 43% of people, they say, are, are overtly angry with their employers because of poor job alignment, because of poor job fit. And you know, everybody in your organization's not well suited for every position in your organization. A key to leadership is finding where those people make their greatest contribution and helping them find their fit. And only 17% of people that were surveyed said that they actually love their jobs. And I would hope that all of you that are here and all of you that are watching that you fall in this category, but I'm a realist. And there's some of you today that may need some inspiration. Our hope is to provide it for you and to reconnect you with a purpose and a reason that you serve. You see, many people live life for this. They live life for retirement. My friends, we may not know when our next day is. We spend all our time, effort, and energy focused on a period of time that may never arrive for us. And how miserable of a life to use the best of what we have, to use our best days, the best of who we are, in a meaningless job 
that we don't like. You see, there are two purposes of work, my friends. The first purpose we talked about earlier is necessity. You'll hear earlier when Andy Stanley speaks on purpose, he says that people have to live and eat indoors. And until people are living and eating indoors, and people are, until people are able to provide for their needs, they're not thinking about purpose. But when people have those needs met, then they can think about purpose. You see, the reason that we exist, the second purpose of work is to express our talents. And everybody in this room has certain God-given talents that you have been provided. As a matter of fact, there's a story in, in the best leadership book I know. It's called The Good Book. And it's a story, the parable of the talents. And in this story, for those of you that may not be familiar with it, there was a master who'd gone away on a long journey. And he entrusted to his servants a certain number of talents. To one of his servants, he had given five talents. To another, he'd given two. And to one servant, he'd given one. And I want you to understand that he didn't give to all the servants equally. Now, the servant that he had given the five talents to, while the master was away, that servant invested those talents. And he returned to the master ten talents, double his investment. And the second servant, he also invested the two talents that he was given, and he returned double to his master four talents. But that last servant, who was entrusted with one talent, does anybody know what he did with it? He buried it. He buried it. And the master had taken what he'd given to that servant and he'd given it to the servant who had proven faithful and had invested the ten talents. And what's that have to do with, with, with leadership? Let me tell you. In your organization and in this room, there are five talent people. There are two talent people and God bless their heart, there's some one talent people out there. All right? But it's expected that whatever gifts you have been given, and we are not all gifted equally, whatever gifts you've been given, it's our responsibility to cultivate those gifts, to grow those gifts to their absolute fullest potential. Because an unopened gift, my friend, is worthless. And every one of you in here have a gift. Every one of you have a talent. Every one of you have something that you can contribute to the world, a reason that you were created, a reason that you exist. And it's up to us to find it and to use it. And so let me share with you three keys to finding your purpose, my friend. Three keys to finding your purpose. The first key is to find your gift. I mentioned that everybody in this room has a gift, but we have to seek it out. We have to find it. Mark Twain said this. He said, the two most important days in your life are the day that you were born and the day that you discover why. This relates directly to this concept of finding our gift. As I mentioned, we were all born with certain talents. We were all born with certain abilities. We were all born with certain potential. Whether or not we achieve that, whether or not we realize that, is up to us. You see, we all in this room have more than what we're currently giving. It's called discretionary end. And I want to illustrate this concept here for you just a minute. I'd like everybody in this room, and those of you that are participating virtually, I'd like you to do me a favor. And just raise your hand as high as you can raise it for me. As high as you can raise it. Okay? And I want you to raise it two inches more. You see that? Every one of you were holding out on me. Every one of you in this room had more that you could give. We're not all fully realizing our potential. And the potential, the gifts that we have been given are not for our use. It's to minister and to serve other people. And I want you to understand something. Everybody in this room here is a minister. You know that, right? It's not just, it's not just our friend Paul. Everybody in this room and those of you that are participating online, you are ministers because if you look at the root word of minister, it means servant. It means servant. And every one of us in this room are public servants. That's our job. To pour out, to invest in other people, to help them grow and to be the best that they can become. You see, we were all shaped differently in life. There are no two people that are alike. No two people have the same DNA or fingerprints. We're all designed differently. And it's important to us to understand how it is that we were shaped. And there's a, a, an acronym for finding your gift, and it's shape, and it stands for spiritual gifts, your heart, your, your um, potential, S-H, A, abilities, and then experiences. I can't spell. <laughs> the first is our spiritual gifts, right? And, and 
if you're not a person of faith, then, then this doesn't apply to you. But those who are believers, um, it's said that the Spirit gifts them with, with certain gifts and certain abilities. And everybody's not gifted equally. Everybody's not gifted the same. But there's certain spiritual gifts that we're all blessed with. But beyond that, the H year stands for our heart. And those, so those are things that you are passionate about. Those things you feel called to do. These are things that you love to do. Things that nobody has to motivate you or inspire you to do because you do those things in and of yourself. That's what it is that we enjoy doing. And then our abilities, and all of us were given different abilities. None of us were gifted the same way. You know, there's some people that have artistic abilities. There's some people that have athletic abilities. There's some people that have mu musical leanings and things along those lines. But, but the reality is that all of us are not gifted the same. We all have different talents. We all have different abilities. You see, if, if, if God didn't bless you like my friend Ricky to be an opera singer right here, he's not going to expect you to be a singer, you know? You're going to be living outside of your shape and your abilities. The P stands for personality, as we had said, and all of us have different personalities. There's some of you in this room that are introverts. There's some of you that are extroverts. There's some of you that are feelers. There's some of you that are thinkers. We are all designed differently. We're all designed differently. And then you think about it, any of you have experience with working with wood, it's real difficult to work against the grain, is it not? And when we are working outside of our shape, it's like working against the grain. And you have some people that try to copy, they try to replicate, they try to duplicate other people instead of just being who it is that they were created to be. And being comfortable with knowing that the way that you were created, the way that you are, is the way that you were supposed to be. The last one here is experiences. Experiences shape us in our lives. And we all have experiences, most of those that are beyond our control. Some of those experiences were positive experiences, were pleasurable experiences in our lives. But there's some of those experiences that we've had in our lives that are painful experiences. They're painful experiences. And it's through those painful experiences that we grow the most. You see, some of the pain, some of the things that we go through in life, you know, we, we, we try to hide those things, we try to suppress them. But we shouldn't do that. We should seek to learn from those things, to use those things to be a benefit to other people. Because people learn better through those than seeing you in your brightest light. There are two challenges that relates to the gifts that we've been given, and I call one of those the gift uh, envy, and the other one is gift projection. And gift envy is basically when we look at somebody else's life and we don't appreciate the gifts that God's given us. We want to be something other than what we are intended to be. And the gift projection is, and I've been guilty of this a time or two, and perhaps some of you too, this is where we expect everybody else to have the same gifts and the same abilities and the same talents, to see and look at things in the same way that we see and look at things, and that's just not the case. Life doesn't work that way. If we're not living according to our shape, it's like fitting a square peg into a round hole. It doesn't work. So if we want to discover our purpose, the first thing that we have to do is we have to find our gift. And we find our gift, what we have to do is we have to develop it. We have to cultivate it. We have to, we have to grow it to its fullest potential. You think about this, this acorn right here. This acorn has tremendous potential, and each of you have seeds of greatness within you as well. Whether or not this acorn achieves its fullest potential is contingent upon a number of variables, but a lot of it has to do with the environment that it finds itself in. And us as leaders, we're responsible for creating the right environment for our people to thrive, our people to grow, our people to succeed. As I said, there are seeds of greatness in all of us. It's up to us to cultivate those, to recognize them. There's a lot of potential, there's a lot of talent that we have that's never fully recognized, it's never fully developed. My friend Les Brown, I'm going to share with you a couple of things that he said. He said the richest place in the world is a cemetery. You know that, right? He said the richest place in the world is a cemetery. It's a graveyard. And I want to read for you something. He said, because it's here you will find all the hopes. It's here you will find all the dreams that were never fulfilled, the books that were never written, the songs that were never sung, the inventions that were never shared, the, cur the cures that were never discovered, all because we were too afraid to take the step in the first place. He also said, he said, imagine if you will, being on your deathbed and you find yourself surrounded by the ghosts of ideas, dreams, abilities, and talents that you were given. And for whatever reason, you never acted on those dreams, you never acted on those ideas, you never acted on those abilities, those talents that were given to you. And those ghosts were standing around your bedside with large, angry eyes saying to you, you never cultivated these things. And now, 
we must go to the grave with you. How many of you have talents? How many of you have abilities? How many of you have giftedness that you're not fully utilizing to its maximum potential? Because if you're not doing something with your life, my friends, it doesn't matter how long it truly is. So finding our potential is a lot like finding a treasure. It's something that we have to see. And in life, personal development doesn't follow a linear path. It's kind of like a pinball machine. You know, you kind of go over here, and the next thing you're over here, and you're over here, until you really find where it is that you fit in, you really find where it is that you belong. And so to assess your abilities and talents, we have to examine and we have to evaluate. And we have to find the things that we enjoy in life and the things that we're good at. And when those things intersect, those are the things that we should do. But it takes experimentation. It takes trying new things that perhaps we haven't tried before. As I said, we have to experiment. We have to test. You see, I, I would not have ever pictured myself being here speaking to an audience. I didn't know I could speak. It wasn't until I had to in an academy graduation that people came up to me afterwards and said, hey, that was pretty good. And it was something that was really a catalyst for me, but if I had not tried that, if I had not taken advantage of those opportunities to grow and develop, you know, perhaps I wouldn't have discovered that this is something that I had the ability to do, and the same thing's true for us. You see, a rubber band's purpose is to be stretched. It's the same thing for us in life. If you are not slightly uncomfortable, my friends, chances are you're not growing. Chances are you're not developing. If you're in your comfort zone, you're not growing. You have to step outside of that zone, my friend, and it's a scary prospect. It's a scary prospect, especially when you don't have all the answers. But what I'll tell you this is that we have to jump and build our wings on the way down. We've got to jump and build our wings on the way down. We have to do things before we're ready to do those things. Because if you're not growing, my friends, you're dying. If you're not growing, you're dying. Third key to finding your purpose is this, is that we need to share our gift. Our gifts were not given to us for our benefit. It wasn't given to us so that we could make a good life for ourselves and our family. Our gifts were given to us so that we could share those gifts with other people. And the best man that I know said this. He said, whoever wants to be great must become a servant. You see, it's not about people serving you. It's about you serving others. And the world thinks of, of, of success as power, as prestige, as position. The greatness is not found in possessions. It's not found in power. It's not found in position or prestige. It's discovered in goodness. It's discovered in character. It's discovered in humility. And most importantly, it's discovered in service. You see, greatness is not measured in terms of how many people serve you. Greatness is measured in terms of how many people you serve. There are thousands of books that have been written on leadership. Thousands of books. But very few books have been written on servanthood. And we believe that that's the only style of leadership that exists, is servant leadership. Dr. King understood this. He said, everybody can be great, my friends, because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. A couple of things I want to share with you before I conclude about what servants do is that they make themselves available to serve. If you're running around so busy that you don't have time to pause and, and, and spend time with your people and develop your people, especially when you think about those relationships at home, we're not fulfilling our role as servants. We have to have margin in our lives and make ourselves available to look after those that we're entrusted to lead. Servants also pay attention to others' lead needs. They're always looking for how can I help, how can I serve, what is it that you need? They're always on the lookout for these things. Many of you are familiar with this picture right here of this officer that uh, had given this man the boots off his own feet. And I love this quote here by John Wesley. It says that in life we need to do all the good we can by all the means we can, in all the ways we can, in all the places we can, at all the times we can, to all the people we can, for as long as we ever can. Servants also are always thinking more about others than themselves. They're thinking about others more than themselves. And the last thing here, or next to last thing rather, is servants think like stewards, not like owners. They understand that whatever you've been given, and friends, whatever you've been given, if it's a child in your life, if it's a, if it's a marriage, those are not your things. Those things were given to you. Those things were given to you. It's your responsibility to look after those things while you have been entrusted with those things. 
And the last thing here is that servants see service not as an opportunity, or not as an obligation, rather, but as an opportunity. You see, when you serve people, you're going to be inconvenienced. You understand that, right? It's not going to happen at times that work with your schedule. And once we understand that our purpose is to serve, our purpose is to look after other people, and we wake up every day with that in mind, hey, I'm here to serve, I'm here to look after other people, right? It helps us in addressing some of those uh, those issues that come up. Albert Schweitzer said this, and those of you that were here heard John Maxwell say this also, the only really happy people in life are those who have learned how to serve. So in concluding, my friend, the three keys of purpose here. The meaning of life is to find your gift. That's the meaning of your life. The work of life is to develop that gift and understand that that's an ongoing, never-ending process. The last here, the purpose of life, is to give it away. Is to give it away. Friends, every day we have an opportunity, especially in this line of work, to serve other people. Every day we have an opportunity to share the gifts that we've been given with other people. How will you use yours? How will you use yours? Will people prosper because of you? Or will you do like the servant who's been given the one talent and bury your treasure? Friends, I encourage all of you, find your gift, cultivate it, and use it to serve other people. Thank you for your time.